Imagine a place where not every corner has been lit up by a camera flash and where secrets still exist. Picture a man, John, with nothing but a list and a dream, crisscrossing state lines and ticking off places most folks wouldn't bother to visit. He'd seen a lot in his travels, but deep in the heartland, along the Mississippi, one evening, he stumbled upon something, well, different. Something that wasn't supposed to be there. Something that followed him with a rhythm that seemed to mimic his own steps. That night, John was all ears. I know how unbelievable this all might sound, but I need you to bear with me. Consider, for just a moment, that maybe cameras and the internet and satellites haven't revealed everything there is to know in the world. I need you to believe in the unknown. Or, if you're a skeptic, at least give me a little bit of wiggle room. I'm going to tell you about John, who had made it his life's mission to see every state in the United States of America. He had a list that he'd pull out from time to time, and every month or so a new location would be crossed off that list. He made good time, if you ask me. He had his bucket list and he stuck to it. He saw his dreams through to the end. But a dream wasn't the only thing that John found. It wasn't all beauty in the good old U.S. of A. John found the ugly, too. He found the parts of the country that people prefer to keep secret, hidden. He found the things that live beneath the surface, the rust underneath the nicely colored paint. John was driving alongside the Mississippi River one hot summer weekend. He couldn't have known that it would turn out so strange. He couldn't have known what he was going to encounter on the banks of that river. He broke down somewhere along where the states of Missouri and Illinois touch each other. One of those towns that don't mean anything unless you were born or raised somewhere inside its limits. He broke down on one of those long scenic roads that wind parallel to the river's beauty. Middle of the night, I guess it was. So late that no other cars or travelers were around. Even the locals had better things to do than idle on the side of the river. So John didn't have much choice but to walk. So he did. He was headed back to the last gas station he'd seen, not far from the little town's historic district. He knew all about how the indigenous people had been chased off their land. He knew all about the prison that was built nearby and the disease that had cut through it sometime after the Civil War. John had a way of making places like that sound haunted. In this case, just maybe, he was right. But it wasn't long before something started following John. He had heard it first, loud clicks, in the rhythm of his own footsteps coming from somewhere in the distance. When he looked back, he could see all the way to the headlights where his car was stopped. No one was standing or walking in between him and that vehicle. He was still alone. Yet, when he turned and resumed his journey, the clicking sound returned. He thought it sounded like boot heels, or maybe even high heels, he said. It was loud pronounced, sharp. He thought about running. His mind was screaming at him to run, to get away. But John had to know. He was the type that had to see what it was. And if he was crazy, you get that by now. He had to see what was behind him just like he had to see all the pretty things hiding around the country. This time, there was a woman standing there. A woman dressed in tattered rags, skinny as a soup bone and dirtier than the brown in the river. John stopped walking. And she stopped too. She just stared, unblinking and wide-eyed. He described her eyes as round, too spherical almost, round and frozen solid, like a deer caught in somebody's high beams. It was like she couldn't believe he was looking at her. John, as good-natured as he was, tried to check on the woman. He took a few steps toward her before he noticed her feet. Hooves, he said. He saw hooves, and all at once felt the weight of the atmosphere closing in around him. It was like the clouds had fallen and were trying to smother him. He felt buried. He felt trapped. Hungry. That was the only word the woman said. Hungry. She repeated it as she shuffled forward. As if the encounter wasn't strange enough, John could hear her voice in the wind. The word didn't come from her lips. Instead, when she opened her mouth, it drifted into his ears from all directions at once. He said he knew what she wanted. He said it was unmistakable. She was going to devour him if he didn't get away. So John ran, ran like lightning, ran back to that gas station, faster than I imagine he ever ran before. He got there, 
safe and alone and terrified. They laughed hard when he told the story. John left that river. He never went back either. Never finished that journey along its banks. You see, John was many things, but he was not prone to exaggeration. His words were the truth. I can promise you that. So if he said he saw a woman with hooved feet, that's what was there. If she was skinny and starving and advancing on him like some horror movie monster, then that's exactly what happened. I don't ask myself whether or not the hooved woman existed. I ask why she was there. I ask why she was so frail, why she was dressed the way she was. The way John tells it, she could have been many things. A spirit from the old prison died from malnourishment, or a creature from even further back, from before the indigenous tribes even dreamed of hunting the land. The way John ends the story is the way I'll end it now. No matter how badly you want to uncover every stone and look at the dirt beneath, some parts of this world just aren't meant to be seen. Some patches of dirt are better left uncovered. And he begs you to heed his warning. The air hung heavy that night, thick with the scent of pine and damp earth. It was August of 2016 and I was out near the family cabin in Umpqua National Forest, a place I practically grew up. My cousin Tyler and I were planning on a quiet overnight camping trip, just a night under the stars, a campfire, the usual. Tyler and I were more like brothers than cousins. Our family spent almost every summer together at the cabin, a tradition that stretched back as far as we could remember. We were partners in crime, always dragging each other into some kind of mischief, building precarious forts out of fallen branches, catching and promptly releasing crayfish from the stream, and waging epic water balloon battles in the dusty clearing behind the cabin. The trip was supposed to be a quick escape, a chance to unwind before school started back up again. Summer break was winding down, and that familiar pit-in-your-stomach feeling about returning to classes was creeping in. Tyler and I had grown up spending summers at the cabin, practically living in the woods behind it. We knew every trail, every swimming hole, every hidden fishing spot. This trip, though, wasn't about grand exploration. We packed light, just a simple tent, sleeping bags, some basic cooking supplies, and enough food to last overnight. We figured a night under the stars, swapping stories by the campfire, was exactly what we needed. It wasn't anything fancy but sometimes the best things are the simplest. We knew the area around the cabin well, and there wasn't anything particularly dangerous lurking in the woods, or so we thought. Looking back, maybe we should have been better prepared, but hindsight is always 20 20 right? We set up camp about a mile from the cabin by a small, gurgling stream. We got the fire going, roasted some hot dogs, argued a bit about who would win a fight, a bear or a wolf. Tyler said bear, I said wolf, duh. The usual stuff. Around midnight, Tyler was elbowing me awake. Dude, he hissed, eyes wide. I followed his gaze and nearly choked on my granola bar. There, across the firelight, maybe 20 yards away, was something standing in the trees. The creature was easily 10 feet tall, which is twice the height of an average human. Its body was incredibly thin, like a stick figure come to life. It was cloaked in shadows, so I couldn't make out much detail about its skin or musculature. The most striking feature was its limbs. It had two long spindly arms that dangled from its torso and ended in what looked like wickedly sharp claws. These claws were at least a foot long, and they glinted faintly in the firelight. The head, if you could call it that, was the most unsettling part. It was completely featureless. No eyes, nose, mouth, nothing, just a smooth obsidian-like surface stretched taut over a vaguely skull-shaped form. It looked alien, inhuman, and utterly wrong. We didn't dare move, barely breathe. The silence between us and whatever that thing was stretched on for what felt like hours. Then it did something even weirder. It raised one of its arms, the one closest to us, and extended all its fingers. They glowed a sickly greenish yellow and pulsed with a faint light like a dying battery. Then it started to speak, if speak is the right word. 
It wasn't any language I recognized, not even close. It was a series of clicks and whistles, high-pitched and atonal, that scraped against my ears like nails on a chalkboard. My skin crawled, and a primal knot of fear clenched in my gut. Tyler whimpered beside me, and I squeezed his arm, the only way I could think of calming him down without making a sound. The thing kept clicking and whistling, its glowing hand outstretched. It took a slow step forward, then another. We were frozen, stuck between fight or flight and pure terror. Then, just as suddenly as it appeared, the creature stopped. It pulled its hand back, the glow fading, and retreated back into the shadows of the trees. One moment it was there, the next, it was gone like a nightmare flickering out. We sat there by the dying embers of the fire, until the first sliver of sunlight peeked through the trees. We didn't sleep a wink, didn't speak much either. We just packed up camp in a daze and hightailed it back to the cabin. We haven't told anyone what we saw out there, not even my uncle who owns the cabin. Maybe we're crazy seeing things out in the woods, but that thing, whatever it was, it was real. And whatever it wanted with us, it didn't get it, at least not that night. The desert wasn't exactly my usual summer hangout. I live with my parents in San Bernardino, surrounded by concrete and car horns. My visits to Uncle Marty's ranch were a yearly tradition, a chance to escape the urban jungle and breathe in the fresh, if slightly dusty air. Uncle Marty wasn't always a desert rancher. He used to be a mechanic back in the city, just like my dad. But a few years back, things changed. My aunt, who I never really knew, passed away unexpectedly. She'd inherited the ranch from her family, a generations-old spread that stretched out for miles in the Mojave. Uncle Marty, heartbroken, decided to leave the city life behind and take over the ranch. I guess he was trying to connect to her somehow out there. He didn't know much about cow wrangling, but he was a stubborn man, determined to make a go of it. The first few years were rough. He learned the hard way about the unforgiving nature of the desert, the relentless heat, the unpredictable droughts, but slowly, he started to get the hang of it. He downsized the herd to a manageable number, learned to read the subtle signs of the desert weather, and struck up a grudging respect with the unforgiving landscape. By the time I started spending summers with him, the ranch was a well-oiled machine, even if it was a dusty, sun-bleached one. We had a routine, early mornings spent mending fences and checking on the cattle, afternoons battling the ever-present dust storms, and evenings spent under the vast desert sky, swatting at mosquitoes and listening to Uncle Marty's gruff stories about his life in the city. It wasn't glamorous, but it was honest work, and there was a strange sense of peace about the wide open spaces, a feeling I never quite got back in the city. That summer, though, the peace was shattered by an encounter with a strange creature. It cast a long shadow over the rest of my visit, a silent question that loomed in the air between us. We never spoke of it, but it was there, a shared experience that had completely changed our desert routine. The heat in the Mojave Desert was something else that night. It wasn't even dark yet, that weird, fuzzy twilight that stretches on forever out there. I was helping my Uncle Marty move some cows from one grazing area to another. We were packed into his beat-up pickup truck, windows down because the AC crapped out ages ago. Uncle Marty was humming along to some classic rock on the radio, and I was staring out the window, trying to ignore the dust swirling around the truck. That's when I saw it, maybe a hundred yards off the road, standing in the middle of some scrub brush. It was tall, easily ten feet its body a grayish black that seemed to suck in the little light that was left. It was humanoid-ish, but way too skinny, like its skin was stretched too tight over its bones. Its head was long and hairless, and it had these huge black eyes that seemed to glow even in the fading light. I froze. Uncle Marty didn't notice. He was still singing along. I stammered, trying to get his attention. Uh, Uncle Marty, you see that? He glanced over at where I was pointing. The radio went quiet. He stopped the truck so fast I almost flew through the windshield. What the... He started, his voice rough. The thing took a slow step towards the road, 
its eyes fixed on us. It wasn't moving like a normal person or animal. It glided, almost like it wasn't even touching the ground. My heart hammered in my chest. I'd heard stories about weird stuff out in the desert, but nothing like this. Uncle Marty grabbed the binoculars from the center console and fumbled with them for a second, before his hands steadied. He took a long look through them, his face pale. Then he threw them down on the seat next to me with a thud. Get down, he rasped. We both ducked below the windows. The truck was quiet except for the pounding of my heart. After what felt like forever, I heard a skittering sound on the roof of the truck. I peeked up slowly, my breath catching in my throat. Two long clawed fingers were scraping across the metal. Panic surged through me. I fumbled for the door handle, but Uncle Marty's hand shot out and grabbed my wrist, his grip surprisingly strong. Don't, he hissed. It'll hear you. The scraping sound continued for a nerve-wracking minute before it finally stopped. Then, silence. We stayed huddled down for what felt like hours, not daring to move. Slowly, I lifted my head a fraction, peeking out the back window. The creature was gone. Relief washed over me, weak and shaky, but relief nonetheless. Uncle Marty finally started the engine, his hands shaking on the wheel. He didn't speak, and neither did I. We drove in a tense silence, the only sound the rhythmic crunch of the tires on the gravel road. We reached the new grazing area and unloaded the cows in a mechanical daze. As I helped him close the gate, the weight of what we'd seen finally hit me. My voice came out shaky. What was that, Uncle Marty? He looked at me, his face grim. I don't know, he admitted, but I sure as heck hope I never see anything like it again. We finished up our chores in a hurried silence, the encounter clinging to us like the desert dust. We drove back to his place, the silence in the truck even heavier than before. Back at the house, I showered, the hot water barely warming the chill that had settled deep in my bones. That night, I lay in bed, staring at the flickering shadows on the ceiling. Sleep wouldn't come. Every creak of the old house, every rustle of wind outside my window, sent shivers down my spine. What was that thing? Where did it come from? And most importantly, was it still out there, in the vast emptiness of the desert night? I tossed and turned all night, the encounter replaying in my mind over and over. As dawn painted the sky a pale orange, I finally drifted off to a restless sleep. The following days were a blur. I went through the motions of helping Uncle Marty with the ranch work, but my mind was constantly elsewhere replaying that terrifying scene. We never spoke of what we saw out on the desert road, maybe out of fear, maybe out of a weird kind of unspoken agreement. But the memory of that night, of the creature with its glowing eyes and scraping claws, has stayed with me ever since. It's a chilling reminder that there are things out there in the world, things we can't explain, and that's a truth that continues to keep me up at night. I used to know a kid from New Jersey. We were about the same age living in North Carolina when we met. I was a senior and he was a grade younger than me. I couldn't tell you how he and I ended up being friends. It just sort of happened. When you're young, friendships can happen like that, unexpectedly. That's one of the nice parts of being a teen, I guess. We were cool and I respected him. But Jersey, as we called him, had this crazy story. It was a story that he would only tell after the party whittled down to just three or four people. It was a story that explained why he sometimes had a distant look that would cross his eyes. A story that shook us to the bone. These days, when I tell it in place of him, I still get cold. Apparently, there's a harvest season for berries in the Northeast. I don't know much about it. That was never the most important part of Jersey's tale. Berry season dragged him out of his home, though dragged him to a small town in the middle of nowhere, with only his parents and a million acres of thick woods surrounding them. Do you know what a million acres of woods looks like? I didn't. It's trees. As many trees standing around you as there might be grass around your feet. It makes you small like that. It makes you smaller than a blade of grass, and just as insignificant. You see, Jersey's story was about the one significant thing. The only thing that really mattered to him even years after the encounter. 
the big thing he couldn't get away from, fear. Jersey went to explore the woods while his parents were occupying themselves with every tourist attraction the small town could flash before their eyes. He wasn't disgruntled or unhappy, just bored. And he liked the woods back then. He liked to watch nature, to listen to it. He liked to identify flowers and mushrooms and draw little pictures of the ones he'd never seen. He had come across a clearing. There was a log thrown across the ground, half overgrown with moss and weeds. Jersey sat himself there and started sketching a picture of the disc-shaped fungus that jutted out from the log like a staircase. It was a peaceful day, the way he described it. Then he heard the howl. As soon as it happened, the tip of his pencil punched through the paper and Jersey jolted upright. He straightened his back, trying to crane his neck and look through the shadowy tree line that surrounded him. He had heard a dog howl before. He had also heard a wolf howl before. Neither of those animals sounded like the thing he heard moments ago. A branch broke somewhere in the distance. The sharp crack of snapping wood echoed in every direction, as hidden by the shadows as the perpetrator itself. Jersey called out. He stammered. He had a stuttering problem sometimes, and I imagine it came out when he was particularly afraid. Hello? Something spoke back, low and guttural, like a bear imitating human speech. He recognized the structure of words, but not their meaning. They were too garbled or too poorly pronounced. It was something pretending to speak, something that wanted him to believe it was human. It was trustworthy. The terror he felt was like ice in his veins, spreading slow like a river of frozen slush chugging through a ravine. It spread like molasses. He felt every inch of his cardiovascular system come alive beneath his skin. While his heart was racing, his body was frozen in place. Then his eyes found the shape in the shadows. It stood like a man. Two legs, broad shoulders, but almost twice as high. Its arms were long and its fingers hooked. Jersey described its head as horse-like. He saw the nostrils flex and huff. He saw the creature's wide eyes regarding him with cruel judgment. He crumpled beneath its gaze. And all he could do was cower on the opposite side of the log. It was his only shelter. Even as he tried to sink behind it, he couldn't stop himself from looking. He peeked over the top of the fallen tree, just in time to see the creature spread its wings. They looked leathery, he said, or coarse like a tarp. They were as wide as the creature was tall, and when they beat, the wind raced across the clearing and stole the breath from the boy's lungs. He couldn't scream. He couldn't form a word anymore. But finally, he looked away. He closed his eyes and pressed himself flat against the ground. He heard it fly away. He felt the crushing atmosphere dissipate as the creature soared to some parts unknown. But Jersey didn't move. He stayed there on the ground. He let night come and the insects crawl over him. He let the mosquitoes bite his skin. When his parents found him the next morning, he was covered in bumps and sores. Jersey never joined his parents for another trip. They didn't want to subject him to it again. No one believed his story at the time. No one except for us, his friends. There's a feeling you get when someone is telling the truth, especially when you know them. It's like some part of you can recognize the vulnerability that they're sharing. One exposed heart recognizes another or something. Besides, he wasn't the only one to see it. We've heard about others, stories from both before and after Jersey's time in the woods. That makes it especially easy to believe, doesn't it? It at least makes it easier to be curious. They have to be seeing something, don't they? And maybe they misdiagnosed what their eyes couldn't decipher. Maybe the shadows tricked them all in this very particular way. But then again, maybe they didn't. And maybe Jersey saw the realest monster of them all. Either way, I don't plan to find out firsthand. If monsters exist, I don't want to find them. It was mid-August in the Outer Banks, and the heat was thick enough to chew on. My buddy Mark and I were overdue for a break. We'd been grinding away on our jobs all summer. Him as a carpenter, constantly on his feet framing houses, and me, stuck in the office cubicle crunching numbers for an accounting firm. Neither of us the outdoorsy types by nature, but the beach had always been our escape. There's something about the endless ocean, the salty air, 
that just melts away the stress. So we piled my beat up Subaru with fishing gear, a cooler full of food, and two tents that hadn't seen daylight since the last camping trip, which admittedly wasn't exactly a recent memory. The drive down to North Carolina was long, the two-lane highway along the last bit stretching out ahead of us like a ribbon of melted asphalt. The radio station sputtered in and out, replaced by long stretches of static. The island we chose was one that was less traveled. It felt like a forgotten corner of the world. There were a few scattered houses here and there, weathered relics clinging to the windswept dunes. We stopped for gas at a ramshackle convenience store the kind where the proprietor eyed us with suspicion through a thick curtain of cigarette smoke. Finally, following a hand-drawn map scrawled on a napkin, we turned off the pavement and onto a bumpy dirt road that led towards the beach. The road eventually petered out, leaving us in a clearing dominated by the skeletal silhouette of a long-abandoned lighthouse. Its paint peeled like sunburn, a testament to the relentless battering of the Atlantic winds. Perfect. We wrestled our gear out of the car, the heat clinging to us like a second skin. Finding a spot to pitch our tents was easy enough. The beach here was vast and deserted. We settled on a spot a good distance from the encroaching dunes, close enough to hear the rhythmic crash of the waves, but far enough away from any potential sandblasting if the wind picked up. As the sun dipped towards the horizon, painting the sky in fiery hues of orange and red, we set about putting up the tents. It wasn't exactly a smooth operation. Tangled poles, misplaced stakes, and a few choice swear words punctuated the process. But eventually, with a sense of accomplishment, we stood back and surveyed our handiwork. Two mismatched islands of green amidst the sea of sand. The sky turned a deep indigo as night fell, and a million stars emerged, glittering like scattered diamonds. We built a fire, the flames casting flickering shadows that danced across the dunes. That's when I heard it. A high-pitched whine, like metal scraping on metal, but impossibly loud. It cut through the silence like a knife, making the hairs on my arms stand on end. Mark looked at me, his eyes wide. What the heck was that? He whispered. We both stared into the darkness, the whine rising and falling in intensity. Then, a light appeared. It wasn't a steady beam, more like a strobe, pulsing a sickly green from above the dunes. My heart hammered in my chest. Neither of us spoke, just watched as the light grew closer, illuminating monstrous spindly legs that seemed to stretch on forever. The whine became a screech, and the thing emerged from the darkness. It was about the size of a large dog, but all wrong. It was insectoid, with a segmented body that glinted an oily black. Its legs twitched and clicked as it scuttled towards us, its head a featureless dome that pulsed with the same sickly green light. Terror locked my legs in place. All I could do was watch as it stopped a few feet from the firelight, its pulsating head seeming to scan us. The smell hit me then, a metallic tang mixed with something rotten, like garbage left to bake in the sun. I gagged, bile rising in my throat. Then, just as abruptly as it appeared, the thing turned and scuttled back towards the dunes. The green light pulsed faster, the screech becoming a whine once more. In seconds it was gone, swallowed by the unnatural darkness. We just sat there staring at the spot where it had vanished, the fire crackling a nervous counterpoint to the silence. Slowly, the feeling of terror started to fade, replaced by a cold, logical dread. What was that thing? Where did it come from? And most importantly, were we alone out here? Mark finally broke the silence, his voice hoarse. We gotta get out of here, he said. We didn't argue. We grabbed what we could carry, not bothering to pack the rest, and sprinted back towards our car. We didn't stop running until we hit the pavement, the rhythmic roar of the engine a welcome sound. We haven't been back to the outer bank since. The memory of that night, that unearthly creature, is burned into my brain. I haven't told many people, afraid of being called crazy, but sometimes, late at night, I lie awake and wonder, what did we see that night on the Outer Banks, and is it still out there watching?
So this thing happened to me a while back when I was out in Montana. You know, big sky country where the plains meet the mountains and the stars are just about the only thing that keep you company at night. I had just finished up a job. I'm a contractor. See, doing odd jobs wherever the work takes me. And I figured I'd take the most scenic route back home. The thing about the scenic route though, it's not just views, it's long, it's empty. And if your truck decides to give out on you, well, you're kind of out of luck. So there I was, driving along this stretch of road, nothing but me and fields stretching out as far as the eye could see. When my truck started acting up, I'm talking about the engine making sounds no engine should make and the dashboard lighting up like a Christmas tree. I pulled over because pushing it seemed like a one-way ticket to a worse situation. I popped the hood and tried to make sense of it all. But let's be honest, I'm no mechanic. I was about to grab my phone to call for a tow when I realized I had no signal. Typical, right? There's me, alone, with a dead truck and a phone that's about as useful as a chocolate teapot. I figured I'd have to hoof it to the nearest anything. I locked up the truck and started walking. The sun was on its way down, and I could just make out the outline of the mountains against the sky. That's when I heard it a sort of low hum that seemed to come from all around me. I stopped trying to figure out where it was coming from. It was odd, not like any animal I'd ever heard. Then, out of nowhere, this shape appeared in the field beside me. It was big, bigger than any bear or animal I've seen, and it moved in a weird way. Not walking, not running, more like gliding. It was too dark to make out much, but I could see it was heading my way. I thought maybe it was the silhouette of an elk at first, but it was too tall, and the way it moved was all wrong. My heart was thumping hard, not because I'm scared of wildlife. I've come face to face with bears and lived to tell the tale, but this was different. It felt wrong. I stood there, trying to figure out if I should shout or make myself big. You know, the usual advice for wildlife encounters. Before I could decide, it stopped at the edge of the road, just staring at me. I couldn't see eyes, but I felt like it saw me, knew me somehow. That's when I noticed the hum was getting louder, and the air around me felt static, like before a storm. My skin started to tingle, and my hair stood on end. I wasn't sure if I should run or not because every instinct told me I couldn't outrun whatever this was. It felt like hours, but it was probably only a few seconds before the shape suddenly turned and glided away, back into the field disappearing from view as the hum faded away. Just like that, as if it had never been there. I stood there for a long moment, trying to convince myself I'd imagined it all. Then I heard a sound from the direction the shape had disappeared to, a sort of clicking noise, like someone tapping on glass. It wasn't threatening, more curious than anything, but I wasn't about to stick around and find out more. I started walking again, faster this time, not looking back, Eventually, I saw the lights of a gas station and almost cried with relief. I told the guy at the counter what had happened, expecting him to laugh or call me crazy. But he didn't. He just nodded like it was nothing new and said, Yeah, happens sometimes. They don't bother anyone though. You got off lucky. He let me use the phone and I arranged for a tow. While I waited, I thought about what he said. They? Like, are there more of them? And lucky? That didn't sit right with me at all. I didn't sleep well that night, and when I went back for my truck the next day, with the mechanic and a tow truck, there was nothing out of the ordinary. No marks, no signs of anything having been there with me. The mechanic got the truck running again, some issue with the battery and alternator, and I drove out of there as fast as I could. But as far as cryptids are concerned, well, I've gotta say I'm sort of on the fence. I mean, the world's a big place, right? and we're finding new species all the time. So it's not a big stretch to think there might be things out there we haven't discovered yet, especially in places like deep oceans or dense forests. Heck, even right here in Montana, there's plenty of space for something to hide out. So with cryptids, I reckon it's important to keep a level head. There's a lot of hoaxes and wishful thinking out there, sure. But every now and then, there's a story that makes you stop and wonder. And wondering is good. It's the first step to finding out new things. In conclusion, while I'm not going to say I believe in cryptids outright, 
I'm also not going to dismiss the idea entirely. The world's got more nooks and crannies than we can imagine, and who knows what's tucked away in them. I like the mystery of it, the possibility. It keeps things interesting and reminds us that we don't have all the answers, and maybe we never will, but that's okay by me. Keeps life from getting too predictable. So there I was, right in the middle of the Florida swamps. Yeah, the place with gators and mosquitoes that could probably carry away a small dog if they worked together. Anyway, I was out there for some field work, doing a bit of biology, tracking animal patterns, that sort of thing. Not glamorous, but it's usually just me, my gear, and the critters. This one night, something was very noticeably different. It was quiet, too quiet. You know how the swamp is never silent, always some critter or bug making noise. Not that night. Even the air felt still, which is a godsend when you think about the bugs, but it was strange enough to make me keep looking over my shoulder. I had set up a trail cam earlier that day, and I was heading back to check on it. That's when I saw the thing that I saw. Now, I'm not one to jump to conclusions, and I'm not about to say it was something from another world, or some long lost beast but it was unlike anything I've ever seen. It stood upright like a man, which was the first thing that caught my attention. I've seen bears on their hind legs before, but this was different. Bears wobble. Their weight isn't meant to be carried like that for long. This thing though, it stood solid, balanced, like that was its natural stance. It was tall, probably a good seven feet or more. Its height was noticeable because even from a distance, it towered over the brush. Its arms hung by its sides, long and disproportionate when compared to a person. The limbs seemed almost stretched, the hands hanging past where its knees would be if it were human. As for its skin, it was pale, kind of a sickly white color that stood out in the dark. It wasn't furry, not like a bear or a big cat. It looked smooth, almost reflective in the moonlight. Its head wasn't quite wolf-like, but it wasn't human either sort of an unsettling in between, with a too long jaw and ears that were pointy, but not like any dog or wolf ears I've ever seen. The eyes were another thing. They had a shine to them, reflective, like I said before. It wasn't just the moonlight though. It was like they had their own inner light, a pale blue that didn't blink. I didn't get close enough to see if it had pupils or anything. Now, when it moved, it was fast and sort of gliding not like anything I've seen in the animal kingdom. No noise, no rustling of leaves or snapping of twigs, just silent, swift motion. My first thought, maybe someone was out there screwing around. I called out, hey, very funny, but it didn't move, didn't make a sound. If it was a person, they were either incredibly patient or incredibly good at holding still. I took a step towards it and that's when it moved, but not like anything normal. It was quick, kind of a blur, and then it was a few feet to the left, like it had just slid over. No sound, no fuss, just moved. And that's when I felt that knot in my stomach, the one that says maybe you should just walk away. But I'm stubborn, and this was my swamp, my study area. I wasn't about to be scared off. So I took out my camera, and as soon as I lifted it, this creature, whatever it was, took off. And I mean, it moved faster than anything I've seen in these parts. Now, I didn't stick around much longer after that. I grabbed my trail cam, nothing useful on it, by the way, and headed back to my truck at a brisk pace. I don't scare easy, but I was done for the night. I kept looking back to make sure I wasn't being followed. Didn't see it again, though, and I don't really want to. So when I'm out in the field now, I'm more aware of my surroundings. You know how it is when you've been somewhere a million times. You start to move on autopilot. Well, not anymore. Every rustle, every splash in the water, I'm on it, checking to see what's there. I even started using one of those handheld GPS gadgets so I can mark spots where I notice anything odd, just in case there's a pattern or something I should be keeping an eye on. Talking to the other folks who work or live near the swamps, well, that's something I do more often now too. They've got stories, sure, and most of them are just tall tales. But every once in a while, someone will say something that makes me think they've seen it too, whatever it was. They never come right out and say it, but the way they talk about the swamp, 
you can tell they've had their own strange nights out there. And every time I'm out there, setting up cameras or collecting samples, I can't help but look over my shoulder. I listen a little closer for anything out of the ordinary, but I keep going back, because that's what you do, isn't it? You face the unknown head on, especially when that unknown is squatting right in the middle of your work. And maybe one day, I'll figure out what it was that stood there, watching me in the moonlight. Or maybe I won't. Some things, they don't wrap up neat with a bow. They just linger, like an unfinished sentence. So yeah, that's where I'm at. I do my work, I keep my eyes open, and I always have an exit strategy. You have to, out here in the swamp, because it's not just about gators and mosquitoes anymore. There's something else here, and it's got me looking at the swamp like it's a whole new world, one with mysteries that don't fit neatly into any box. And that's just how it is. So I had this wild experience down in Scape Ore Swamp in South Carolina. It was one of those spur of the moment things. I just wanted to clear my head and soak in a bit of nature. So I hopped in the car. The swamp had always been this place of mystery, a little bit of wild just waiting to be explored. I heard stories about it, but nothing beat seeing it yourself. It was a solo walk for me, or so I thought until the creature showed up and turned a quiet walk into an insane encounter. Let's just say the swamp has a mind of its own, and it will let you know who's in charge. I was just trudging along, minding my own business, and the deeper I got, the more it felt like I wasn't alone. You ever get that creepy feeling on the back of your neck, like someone's watching you? That was me all the way, and the swamp wasn't helping, all quiet except for the crunch of my own steps. I tried to shrug it off, keep going but then everything just shut up the crickets frogs everything stopped dead it was like they all knew something i didn't so i stopped too hard in my throat waiting for i don't even know what it felt like the swamp knew something was up and it wasn't me it was waiting for then it got real weird i heard this sound like something big moving in the mud i'm no chicken but let me tell you i was scared and then i saw him the lizard man. I kid you not. It's like every story you've heard about him came to life right in front of me. This thing was massive, towering over me like some kind of prehistoric throwback. His scales were a deep green, not just one shade, but a whole palette like the leaves of the swamp oaks around us. They interlocked over his muscles, which bunched and shifted with each silent movement he made, like armor plating on a living tank. The way they caught the weak light made them shimmer with a slick, almost iridescent quality, casting a spectral gleam on the twisted roots at his feet. And those eyes, man, they were fierce, piercing, two glowing orbs in a face that was all sharp angles and predatory grace. You know how in the movies, when something otherworldly shows up, it's all CGI and effects. This was nothing like that. This was real flesh and blood, and the power coming off him was something raw something fierce. He had this primal aura, like a king in his court, unchallenged owning the night. And his hands, they were these large clawed things, articulate like a man's but with the lethal promise of a beast. Each breath he took was deliberate, a silent statement of his presence, misting slightly in the cool air. He didn't just stand, he loomed, a statue of living muscle, just existing there in the swamp. I should have run, but I couldn't move. We were just staring each other down when I finally found my voice. Who are you? I asked it. Stupid, right? Like he was going to answer. He just kept on staring, and I swear it was like he was weighing me up, deciding if I was worth the hassle. So I started backing up slowly, but for every step I took, he took one forward. It was a dance I didn't want to be involved in at all. The swamp now felt like it was closing in on me turning the path into a trap. I was sure this was it for me, like my last day on earth. Then I tripped, fell flat on my back and thought, this is 100% how I go. But he didn't move, didn't jump me or anything, just watched. So when the clouds moved and the moon showed up again, I didn't wait for a second. I ran like my life depended on it, because it probably did. That swamp played tricks on me, 
making the path feel like it was stretching on forever. And worst of all was that he was following me. I was in pure survival mode, dodging branches, jumping roots, you name it. But when I finally broke free into a clearing, the creature, he just stopped at the edge, like he couldn't come out into the open, like he couldn't be fully seen. I caught my breath, looking back at him. In the moonlight, he almost looked magnificent, but that didn't change the cold fear inside me. So I ran out of that swamp as fast as I could and didn't stop until I hit pavement. The next day, I head to my one friend's house since he's having a bonfire, and I start telling everyone about this lizard man. I'm trying to keep it cool, not let on how freaked out I was, but the more I talk, the more I can see their eyes getting wider. I recount every detail, from the moonlit scales to the glowing eyes, and I can tell they're hanging on every word, half in disbelief, half wanting to believe every word. I'm gesturing wildly, my voice getting louder with the retelling, and they're totally listening, some looking spooked, others just fascinated. There's this mix of excitement and fear around the fire pit as they start picturing this creature from my story as a living, breathing thing out there in the swamp. Here's the kicker. Some of them, they wanted to go after him, take him down. Can you believe that? But I couldn't do it. He let me go. So I led them on a wild goose chase instead, away from where I saw him. Fair's fair, right? Still gives me chills, though. Just goes to show, some things out there we're not meant to mess with. Do you think ghosts crave the parts of their lives that they can't get back? Do they ever miss the routine and try to replicate it? Like getting ready for work or sitting in traffic? Maybe haunt a water cooler at the office? Do they crave other things too, like people? Or their favorite drink at the bar? Maybe even sweets? Out of context, maybe. But you see, Caleb insisted that ghosts love their sweets. He said his grandma used to haunt her old kitchen trying to steal the last piece of pineapple upside down cake. He said kids or their spirits were especially guilty of that. He said if you knew how to look, you could catch a ghost with its hand in the cookie jar nine out of 10 times. Kind of morbid if you ask me. But Caleb had a pretty convincing story. Say one thing about Caleb and you'll certainly say that the man knew his sweets. He opened a gourmet cookie shop straight out of college put his degree to use by mastering the art of a thick icing and the perfectly shaped chocolate chip. He ran the place solo too, at least for a while. He came in early to start the baking, ran the storefront on his own during the busy hours, stayed late to clean up each night. Caleb loved his cookies, what can I say? Other people did too. There was a small buzz about his establishment permeating the town. They hadn't seen a new restaurant in years, let alone one so niche. This drew out the largest crowd that the small town could muster, day in and day out. Then it started drawing in things at night. Caleb first noticed the handprints. He'd clean the store top to bottom, front to back, sweep the floor and wipe the glass. It would be 10 p.m. before he was ready to go. And like clockwork, he'd emerge from the kitchen with his keys in hand and spot a new, small handprint pressed up against the bottom pane of the front door. He wiped the glass again in the mornings, wondering how he missed it the first time. That went well, until the night the handprint was on the interior side of the glass. That's when he first realized his cookie shop was attracting a different kind of visitor. Unfortunately for Caleb, he mistook this particular guest as friendly. He made a game out of it, absent-mindedly talking to the spirit as he went about his work. He mentioned the ghost to his regulars, claiming that he was excited for the day that he could serve a cookie to a patron from the other side. Somehow the kid got in the kitchen. The mishap started at first. Blenders would short circuit. Power would suddenly get cut to the refrigerators. Despite repeated repairs and visits from the local handyman, Caleb couldn't get ahead of the electrical issues. At his wit's end, he decided the ghost must be responsible. So he tried to appeal to it. He made the spirit its very own cookie, a chocolate chip cookie, topped with pink frosting and brown sugar, decorated with topping made from another identical cookie that Caleb had crumbled by hand. He thought it was the perfect treat for a child. It had to be the perfect treat for a child ghost too. 
At some point overnight, while Caleb wasn't there, something ate that cookie, left the plate clean. For a while, things got back to normal. Business resumed, but one morning when Caleb came in, that same plate was set out on the counter. He recognized it at once. The spirit was demanding another cookie. He made it. Days later, the plate came back. And on that third time, Caleb refused. How long was he supposed to put up with that? He needed to put his foot down, find another solution. The spirit did not agree. One night, while Caleb was closing, the building came to life. In the kitchen, the cabinets opened or closed any time that he turned his back. The appliances slid from their places on the counter and crashed onto the floor. Caleb lost his cool. Anybody would, I think. He started yelling at the kid. Yelling at the walls, I guess. Because how can you yell at someone that you can't see? He was losing money by that point. He was losing time. The charm of being visited by some invisible specter had long faded away. But Caleb invited it in, didn't he? When he set that plate out the first time, he might as well have welcomed the spirit with open arms. It's always easier to invite somebody over than it is to ask them to leave. Caleb finished shouting, red-faced and out of breath. He looked around, taking the silence in the room as victory. Then a plate flew by his head and exploded against the wall behind him. A chair toppled over and skidded across the floor. Those cabinets, which he'd already seen open and close, started swinging on their hinges, knocking shut. Bang, bang, bang. Another plate burst into pieces. Caleb realized how futile his situation was and turned to leave the building. He ran, stopped to lock the front door behind him. When he turned around and glanced back inside, the ghost was looking back. A short kid in a baseball cap, dressed for game day, it looked like. The kid was looking back at him, hand on the glass where it had been placed so many nights before, and then the spirit disappeared. Caleb let his eyes wander beyond it, away from the space where the figure had vanished, and he realized that the inside of his store wasn't damaged at all. Everything was clean and in its place. Everything was fine. He took a few days off from work anyway. Whenever somebody asked about the ghost, he shut them down. Caleb only serves the living now, and that cookie hasn't made its way back onto the menu. Most of these stories, I think, only work if the creature is still alive. I mean, there has to be some sort of peril, right? Some sort of danger, an immediate threat. The jaws have to be closing in for the teeth to feel scary, don't they? That's true for most stories, but that isn't true for Nicole's. Nicole's story always got under my skin, even when I fully believed she was safe all along. Nicole's job, to the benefit of tales like this one, is inherently frightening. She works in and around Antarctica, ice shelves, research stations, vessels along the coast. It's cold, it's isolated. If you stare at the ice or the ocean long enough, out into either of those blank canvases, your brain starts to paint its own visions. What's more terrifying than the inability to trust your own senses? This story thankfully relies on the senses of an entire crew. Nicole isn't the only person this happened to, although she's the one who first recited the tale to me. It was an encounter unlike any other, she said. They found something floating among the ice, something so big and so terrifying that her vessel came home, abandoned their research project, and when they said why, they were ridiculed. It's easy to pin a mystery on the weakness of the mind, you see, and blaming a hallucination is a lot easier than considering the truth. A large chunk of the ice shelf had just broken away. It was irrelevant to the research this crew was performing, so they got to watch the incident unfold with the genuine curiosity of spectators. They were impressed, awed, and terrified by the implications. It's hard for a scientist not to worry about the melting of the ice, but once the collapse of the shelf had concluded, they noticed a peculiar amount of debris had become dislodged from somewhere within or underneath the ice. Chunks of amorphous gray matter bobbed in the sea. They moved the vessel closer to investigate. Each chunk of matter was a different size from the last. They looked genetic, like meat of some kind. The group theorized that they were seeing the remains of a whale fall. They pulled a piece of the material aboard the ship, 
and regarded it with a tense caution. They only contacted the matter with long and narrow tools, with suits on their body and visors over their faces as protection. This particular sample was the size of a small car. It dwarfed the individual scientists, but it was far from the largest piece out there. Through the day, more remains floated to the surface and drifted away. They couldn't decipher its exact species or its exact age. Not yet anyway. They worked in shifts, but eventually, they fell asleep together. That was until something collided with the ship and knocked the scientists from their bunks. They struggled to find their sea legs while the vessel rocked, and the furniture skewed from one side of the room to the other. They shouted, yelled, and demanded answers. None of them knew what was happening. They emerged a few hours before dawn. They thought more ice had broken away and maybe drifted into the stern, but it wasn't a piece of ice at all. It was a body. They spotted the massive, smooth flesh of a whale, motionless, pale. It was dead. They could see that chunks had been torn away from its torso, which explained the debris in the water, but not the creature's enormous size. It was so big, in fact, that they couldn't see either end of it, head or tail. Each side of the creature sunk back into the depths, exposing only the curved ridge of its back. It was too dark for any sort of reliable photography, but the scientists hurried to take whatever notes they could. Nicole joined them. Then she pointed out what looked like a second body, beginning to float up alongside the first. It was more narrow and much smaller, but obviously of the same genetic material. The skin was stretched thin and reflected the glow of their flashlights. This one, it seemed, would at least give them a glance of its tail. But what emerged from the waters was a complete five-digit hand. It wasn't a second creature at all. It was the arm of the first. It was a limb, the length of the very ship Nicole was standing on. Each finger was easily the size of her body. No one said anything at first. They all stared, unblinking, as the uncertainty of what they saw crept into their veins. Slowly, the giant specimen began to turn. The water was rotating the corpse, as if to ensure that the vessel got a full view before even getting a chance to turn away. It rotated in the water until the shoulder linking the arm to the torso could clearly be seen. They gasped. A few of them, like Nicole, were even crying. Then they saw the face. Giant openings where the eyes used to be, arranged in the same anatomical structure as a human head. The bridge of a nose. The nostrils had been eroded by the water. Strangely, they couldn't see a mouth, only a smooth flap of skin leading from the bottom of the nose to the chin, the neck. They were looking at some giant humanoid creature, something that had been hidden by the ice. But they didn't feel enlightened. The excitement of discovery didn't welcome them here. Nicole knew, like the rest of them, that they were seeing something that nature intended to hide. They were seeing something that they shouldn't have. And so, the vessel fled. They arrived home with a story and a specimen, although it was quickly dismissed as a piece of a whale carcass. It took Nicole years to tell the story. While skeptics have used that to discredit her, who can really blame her? They had had a piece of a giant creature aboard with them on that ship. They disturbed his grave, and you don't just recover from that.